Hi, this is Ben with Novel X Stereophonic, and the subject of today's video is the Concept 16.5 Stereo Receiver. This is a very cool and somewhat rare receiver from the late 1970s, and you'll notice that I have the covers removed already. I'm going to take a little bit of a different order with this video compared to some of my other restoration reviews, because this unit is so interesting in its internal construction and layout and things that that's gonna be the main focus, and it really defines why this piece is something special that you should look out for. So if that sounds interesting, stick around and we'll get started. So let's start out with a little bit of history. So first off, this brand concept is a little bit obscure. This is what's called a house brand. So in the 1970s, there was a lot of hi-fi retailers that um, had chains and they would sell the typical brands, Pioneer, Kenwood, Sansui, Yamaha, but they would also sometimes produce their own equipment, which gave them better profit margins. So they would create a brand and a series of components and sell those at their stores. And a lot of times they were specified in such a way that they would match or exceed um, some of the higher end units or more well-known brands. And it allowed the salesman to sell against a um, a more well-known brand to give the user the same uh, you know, audio experience, in some cases even better, and, and secure some more profit for the, for the retailer. So that's kind of what a house brand is and where this fits in. So the, the Hi-Fi retailer that, that was the parent company for Concept was called Pacific Stereo. It's a, a West Coast company that had a lot of different locations. They started out in around 1960, um, and were called Pacific Electronics. They eventually changed the name to Pacific Stereo. Uh, throughout the company's history, it eventually got purchased by CBS in 1973. And by 1986, the market had changed a lot and the stores ended up closing. So this was produced in that um, kind of golden era of Silverface Hi-Fi in the late 70s. And I believe this was a direct competitor to the Pioneer SX1250. The SX1250 retailed for around 950, where the 16.5 was about 900, and they both had the same power output range. We have 165 watts here on the 16.5, and the, uh, the 1250 was a 160 watt rated unit. Now, the model number 16.5 uh, indicates the wattage. So the other ones in this series, you can de uh, decipher the, the wattage output of the unit by the model number. So this unit was conceptualized by a engineer, and I hope I don't butcher his name, Richard Schramm, who later went on to found Parasound. So it, it was developed by, by him, and his strong suit was working with the Japanese OEM manufacturers to create um, products for Pacific Stereo. So there was an, an interview that I found with him, and I'm just going to read a quote. I had the unique benefit of our size, CBS's backing, and direct unfiltered feedback from a very demanding sales force. I learned to create products that were saleable, reliable, and most of all relevant. So that's kind of the backdrop of how this unit was developed. The, the salesman and probably the, the management at Pacific Stereo was looking for a few specific things. They wanted something that was going to have the same features as the big brands, have great performance, and as we'll see with the design, be extremely easy to service. So I think it was mission accomplished by, um, by Richard, and this is a great design and very sought after. So next we'll take a look at the inside so we can review this in a little bit more detail. All right, looking inside of the Concept 16.5, for me at least, I think it's very reminiscent of an SX1250. So the shielded tuning sec section, shielded phono stage. We've got heat sinks along the side here that wrap around the back. Modular design for the power amplifier output section that can be pulled out of the chassis and worked on outside of the unit. Then I guess the main difference would be the, the the power transformer topology. So in an SX1250, it's one large toroidal power transformer with two capacitor uh, banks on the outsides of the transformer. Concept took it one step further by separating the power transformer. So there's one power transformer for the left channel and one for the right channel with an independent filter bank. These transformers are really big. This is uh, you don't really have a reference here, but this is about the same size as a 9090 dB power transformer. So this thing is an absolute monster. Now for uh, the design, we have driver cards here. 
This is a combination protection and power supply card, and then these little um, trimmers here just adjust the front panel meters. These are very easy to pull out. It's just four screws and, and connectors, some on the bottom and, and some on the, uh, the top of the card, depending on which card it is. And those can be pulled out of the chassis for service. So this, I'm guessing, was part of the feedback loop that um, Pacific Stereo had. Uh, like many other hi-fi re retailers at the time, they had a service department. So in addition to the salesman telling um, the, uh, the designer what they wanted out of a specific unit at a specific price point, I'm guessing they also consulted the service department and said, hey, what do you guys want? And I'm sure they said, make it modular. So that's what we have. Very nice design, easy to, to service, which is always a plus. So that's, uh, that's kind of the inside of this thing. Oh, we do have relays on the back here. This is, this is pretty neat as well. Not many receivers of this time period have an independent relay for each speaker output. So this shortens the signal path. Usually in a receiver like, again, the Pioneer SX1250, there's one single protection relay that clicks and then the signal travels to a speaker switch, a rotary switch um, that selects which speakers are active or you know a push button combination switch. In the case of the 16.5, that when the protection circuit activates, it allows each one of these relays to function, and then a front panel switch will turn on the relay. So it just shortens the signal path. Um, the speaker outputs go straight into the relays, and then you select which relay you want. So an, again, another improvement in design. It does add another failure point, I guess, because you have three rel relays to worry about rather than one, um, but they're um, pretty reliable overall. And next, we will jump into the restoration review. This is the first concept piece that I restored. I had a lot of fun researching this unit, but one of the big challenges was coming up with service literature. So being that it was a house brand, the literature wasn't as, as widespread with Pioneer, Kenwood, Yamaha. You can just look up the service manuals for these things, get all the information you need to get it up and running again. With one of these, the only publicly available document that I know of is the schematic. So that's going to be missing things like tuner alignment, DC offset and bias adjustment, meter calibration. So that's stuff that I had to kind of sleuth around and figure out on my own. But I'm happy to report I got it all figured out and did all the adjustments and everything is working really, really well. So. I'm going to go through the, the restoration that I did on this unit, and I should mention, I'm gonna post a link in the description to what I used as a reference for this restoration. A lot of times I like to look at what other people have done to get some ideas, because being that this was the first time I worked on this, I don't know what normally fails on these units. So I'm gonna post a link to the Tapeheads um, forum article that I used as a reference for this. This was written up by a guy that I guess at one point worked for uh, Pacific Stereo or for many years and eventually acquired the, the company name after they went out of business and continues to service concept equipment. So he's got a lot of experience with these and posted a really good write up on his restoration of this specific model. So check out the description for that if you're interested. So the first thing that I did on this one was address a fuse issue. So I'm going to see if I can find one of these that's, that's kind of cracked. Yes, right here. So. The first thing I noticed when I opened this thing up was I had loose fuses. They were kind of just flopping around in these fuse holders. And I guess it was just um, the, me the metal that was used on these at the time wasn't that great. And they get really brittle at this joint and end up just cracking. And when that happens, the tension can't be held on the fuse anymore and stuff's not going to work properly. So I ended up finding an almost exact fit replacement for those and got all of those replaced. We'll look at that later when I open up the bottom of the unit. Another common failure on these is the power switch. These can be taken apart and cleaned, but there is a very good um, seller on eBay that has new old stock versions. It's not the exact same. Uh, I think it's missing these front two contacts, which aren't used anyways. So there's a real uh, NOS direct replacement for this switch. So I put that in as preventative maintenance. For the relays, they were, they were all working, but I'm a little bit wary of leaving old relays in. So what I did is I consulted with my customer and we decided to replace the speaker A relay, but um, then pick the best remaining two relays and just clean them for the B and C as those aren't going to be used as much. So I did replace one relay. Again, this is an, an Omron part, so an exact replacement is available. It just takes some digging to find the right one. Let's see. Um, a bulk electrolytic capacitor replacement. Now this unit had very low hours, so I could tell by the, the lamps and just the general wear on the circuit. All of these capacitors tested okay. They could have stayed in the unit, but as part of a restoration, it's great to, to replace everything while we're in there and do a little upgrades as well. 
these are the capacitors that didn't perform up to snuff and on the driver card there's actually a couple spots where the um an equivalent circuit would be the capacitors linked together like this we have the negatives tied together and the positives on the outside this is essentially a bipolar electrolytic capacitor and i don't know if it was cost savings or what at the time but on the pcb it's laid out to be wired up like this but i went ahead and converted those uh, locations to to real bipolar capacitors when i measure across this with the meter i get pretty high esr so this is something that that i was happy to address and upgrade with a different part and that's where you see uh, the little green capacitors those are bipolar nichicon muse i also addressed address the trimmer pots for the DC offset and bias. Upgraded the differential pairs. This helps with DC offset and channel balance and things like that. So those got updated with modern semiconductors and thermally coupled. And then I guess it wasn't very necessary in the power supply, but I added uh, peat sinks to these TO220 package transistors. And it also it's very important on the driver cards for those transistors, they get extremely hot. I think I measured about, was it? 160 degrees or something at um, at idle so those ones definitely benefit from adding heat sinks to them and along with that it refreshed the thermal compound on all of the uh, transistors that had heat sinks and pulled all of the output transistors brand new micas new thermal compound slapped those back on these capacitors were uh, all good and I wanted to keep these if possible too because it's hard to find replacements of the, the correct diameter without going way down in size so it looks a little bit different. And these are actually concept branded. So luckily these all tested out great and those were okay to stay in the unit. This video would not be complete without a look uh, inside of the bottom part of the chassis. So again, you can see just really, really nicely constructed. The tone card here, it's just four connectors, four nuts, and this entire card can be pulled out for service. So on this one, all the tantalum capacitors got replaced with film. For the electrolytics, I used audio grade where applicable. The phono stage down here has a switch on it that I took apart and cleaned the switch. Again, replacing all the electrolytics and tantalums on that board. We've got the fuse uh, replacement here. So a very nice kind of factory match for the fuse replacement there. Radial, or sorry, axial capacitor. And then one of the more challenging parts, I guess, is these selector switch assemblies. There's a, a daughter board installed on top of the switches for the LED indicators, and that has to be removed in order to clean the switches properly. So that was probably the most challenging thing about this whole restoration. The, the rest of it was pretty straightforward. and It's a very enjoyable piece to work on because you get instant gratification as you rebuild a card and put it back in. You can test it very quickly without desoldering and soldering a bunch of connectors. So next up, let's take a look at the scene in action. Okay, we're now looking at the front panel of the Concept 16.5, and as you can see, I've got the covers installed. So every time I touch this thing, I find more similarities between it and the Pioneer SX1250. So the wooden cover here is just a simple U-shaped piece of plywood with some bracing. It has a vinyl veneer on it, uh, not real wood. So rosewood vinyl, looks very nice. And then the top cover is very similar to a 1250 as well. It kind of has a lip on it and it backs in and folds down on top. It also has the same output transistors as a SX1250, which is interesting. So let's get on to the, to the front panel. So um, a lot of people say that this unit is not as aesthetically pleasing as other Silverface audio, but I really like the way that this piece was designed. Um, I uh, have spent a lot of years in the home automation industry, and one of the things I specialized in was tweaking user interfaces to make them uh, as simple as possible for a customer to use. So that was remote controls, mobile applications, touch screens, things like that. I'd be in charge of arranging the buttons and the naming and their functions so that we could hand that device to a client and barely had to train them at all. Our goal was that it would be so simple and intuitive that they could pick it up and press the buttons and interact with it without too many questions. And I think the designers of the Concept 16.5 pulled that off in, uh, in this unit. So some things right off the bat, we have this theme of kind of rectangular shaped controls and, and symmetry, right? We've got these round buttons in the middle and then all the rectangular buttons on either side, just a really, really nice looking, in my opinion, uh, from a design standpoint. And they were able to keep this beautiful large face simple um, 
in a few different ways. And one of that those reasons was being able to avoid indicator light. So as you change the sources here, there's no indication inside of the dial. With a rectangular knob like this, it's not really necessary because from a distance, you can pretty easily tell by the orientation of this rectangular control which source is currently active. So that's that. And then with these LED indicators, this gives us um, an indication of status and in some cases state depending on the button. And they use the colors red and green to, to kind of help uh, identify what was happening at the time. So let's go ahead and power this on. So we've got the, the beautiful display here. It's a very simple lighting scheme with a diffuser. So again, keeping it simple, but also very classy. So when this unit comes on initially, this will be red until it comes out of protection and then it will flip to green. So red is bad, green is good. When the unit has a speaker activated when you power it on, you'll hear the relay click when it turns green. If there's no speaker activated when we push the power, there'll be no relay. This is just giving all three of those speaker relays a signal that yes, you're good to, to close. So if I close two relays and then try to close a third, it disables the speaker output to protect the amplifier from an impedance that's too low. So each one of these controls an individual relay on the back panel. You notice speaker A is much quieter. That's the new relay and speaker B has the original relays. So a little bit louder physical contact there. The meter button here changes the state of um, the meters here. So I'm going to go to FM. We've got signal strength and tuning. Let's go up to a strong station here. So we've got our signal meter and our tuning meter. And then if we depress this button, I'm just gonna disable the speaker and raise the volume here so we can see. So as I'm raising the volume, that's our output power. I believe that's an average between both channels. And then we have um, an indication kind of of the stereo, stereo imaging, which channel you know is louder than the other at any given time from center. So very cool how they did that dual function meter. Um, Again, saving money and, and real estate uh, without losing features, which is great. Tone defeat is pretty much self-explanatory when this control is engaged. Green, tone defeated, these circuits are out um, of, the, of the signal path. On this side, if we're selected on a phono input, this will turn green for phono 2. And again, from a distance, if you're looking at it and you see this vertical and this green, you know which phono input you're on. FM muting is a, has two different states. So when you're locked in and you're unmuted, it's green. And when you are off station, it will indicate red. And then if you switch sources, let's see. Oh no, it does still stay on. So that's our FM muting. Mono switch is pretty self-explanatory. On the tape monitors, this left one activates tape monitor and then the other one will tell you which uh, tape you're on. Tape one is uh, when it's depressed and red, and tape two is when it is out. Yes. High filter, this just adds in a roll off to the signal. And then the tone controls, I really like how they did these. So instead of, um, well, this is a concentric control, first of all, so there's a front and a back element to it. Usually when this is done, you'll have like bass, mid, and treble, and then you'll be able to control the left and the right channel independently. I've never been a fan of that scheme, but they managed to do something really cool here, which is they gave you a four band EQ adjustment here while only taking up two controls. So the ones that are more common, bass and mid, which are on the front, is a 20 detent control. So if I take it all the way to one side and count one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, I'm centered. We're in the back on the mid bass, which is less commonly adjusted. That one only has 10 detents total. So from the left, one, two, three, four, five, and I'm back to center. So that gives you your um, four frequency response response points there. Again, can be defeated here, which is a nice feature. We've got balance left and right with a center detent. So when we come into here, it clicks into the center position and then a variable loudness control. So a lot of times on receivers, you have to push a loudness button and then it's tapped off of the volume control and it will kind of automatically adjust the loudness based on what volume level you're at. This gives the end user a little bit more control. So you can back this down and what this does is it adds in a 
um, you know, the Flesher Munson curve that, that compensates for how the human ear works at lower levels. So you can tune that to your liking. And it can also, when you lower this, it increases the rotational range of that volume control. It gives you more granularity, if you will. So all the way up is flat. And that kind of covers it for the, the controls and how this unit functions. Again, it's, the theme is always like basic, straightforward, all the features while looking very nice in my opinion. Um, let's see. And the other interesting thing, so you have two headphone jacks, but what it's missing is a microphone jack, which in my opinion is just an extra feature that, I don't know if it was popular back in the day, but I could never see anyone using that microphone jack on a piece of vintage stereo equipment nowadays. So the fact that it's not there doesn't bug me. Um, so overall, very well executed design, easy to use. The controls feel solid. Um, just a very nice unit to interact with in every regard. So next we'll spin it around and take a look at the back panel and I will go over some of the tests that were done post restoration. The back of the 16.5 uh, caught me off guard the first time I looked at it. This specific color, you rarely see gray on the back panel of a piece of stereo equipment from the 70s. This is more like 90s, maybe early 2000s style on a lot of the hi-fi equipment. So if you were to look at this without knowing what it was, it might catch you off guard. You might think that it's from the wrong era. We've got switched and unswitched outlets here. Two fuses on the back. That's because, again, this is a dual mono design and there's no... Uh, 220 volt or other world voltage switching because this was a product that was primarily designed for the US market. We have pre-out made jumpers here and then our inputs and very basic once again, no auxiliary input on this. We have two tape loops and two phono inputs, that's it. Antenna inputs for the tuner, loop stick for AM that can rotate and tilt. Before I wrap up this video, I wanted to go over some of the performance testing that I did on the unit after the restoration. So when I completed the power amplifier rebuild, I did a distortion test on the power amplifier section with a sine wave fed directly into the amplifier input. And at 165 watts per channel with both channels driven into eight ohms, the distortion was about 0.03%. I repeated that test once the preamp was restored, linked the two units together. And on that test, it was a little bit over 0.05%. At that point, I did a frequency sweep through the entire audio band and the distortion stayed pretty stable from about 10 Hertz all the way up to three or four kilohertz. And then once I got into the higher parts of the audio band, the distortion approached what the spec sheet has it rated at, which is 0.1%. I also did a maximum output power test, a, a hard clipping test, and the unit performed up to 180 watts before it started to clip. So overall, very great performer. Thank you so much for stopping by the channel today and checking out this video on the Concept 16.5. If you like this content, please subscribe. I'll have many more videos to come on the endless vintage hi-fi projects that I'm working on. Thanks again. See you next time.